changed times for the Balmoral Show. This year, the Royal Ulster Agricultural Society moved its show to its new home outside Lisbon, and it proved a hit. with record numbers attending the three-day event. You could almost forget what this place used to be. Bringing the show here to the site of the former Mays prison is the first move in one of the biggest redevelopments in Europe, with the potential to provide a major economic boost. We've got 347 acres here, so you're talking about something that's twice the size Titanic quarter and four times the size of Canary Wharf. And we're talking about a target of over 5,000 jobs. We're talking about an investment of about 300 million pounds. So pretty significant stuff. The success of the Balmoral show here at its new site is exactly the kind of thing that Stormont wants for this place. But perhaps the real test for this whole project will be how they deal with the remnants of the old maze prison behind me and the deep divisions that that's causing, not just in government, but amongst victims. There will be industrial areas and office complexes, but at the heart of the project are plans for an 18 million pound building dedicated to peace, with plans to utilize what remains of the prison just 30 meters away. The go ahead was given last month and that reignited a bitter row over the project. I set off to find out if one of the most divisive sites in Northern Ireland is the right place to put a building dedicated to reconciliation. And given the site's history, will it inevitably become a shrine to terrorism? The maze began life as an internment camp called Long Kesh, with Nissan huts initially housing the prisoners in 1971. For the next 29 years, it was the scene of some of the trouble's most defining moments. Protest and murder took place within its walls, but it will always be strongly associated with the hunger strikes of the 1980s in which 10 Republican prisoners died. Raymond McCartney was 17 when he was first imprisoned in the maze. In 1979, he joined the dirty protest, demanding the right to be treated as a political prisoner. He remembers the call going out two years later for volunteers to escalate the protest to a hunger strike. It was spelt out in explicit terms what hunger strike could and would mean. And I, re I remember making the decision, doing a lot of soul search and asking questions of myself. And I volunteered my name that I felt that I felt that the decision was the right one to make. And also it was a personal one which I wanted to make as well. We are prepared today to prove that we are special prisoners. He spent 53 days on hunger strike without food his body began to shut down. You found that your ability to focus your eyes, it wasn't so much that your eyesight failed, but your ability to hold your eyes and focus was, was deteriorating because the muscles around your eyes were, were, were obviously wasting and that meant then your eyes weren't in full control. You know, wanting to get up out of bed became, you, know, you were comfortable lying in bed, whereas your instinct would have been normally would have been up to do a bit of walking about. By the end of the hunger strikes, 10 men had starved themselves to death. The first to die was 27-year-old Bobby Sands. The story of the hunger strike has reverberated around the world, and for Raymond McCartney, this makes the maze the ideal spot to build a peace center. Many of us, you know, see it as part of our lives. You take into consideration, you know, the impact that the hunger strike had on the wider political uh, situation in Ireland and abroad, and uh, therefore, to us, it's just something that's a historical site and therefore should be preserved. But what about the families of those killed in the Troubles? I wanted to find out what they thought about the maze as a location to build peace. On the 5th of January 1976, B. Wharton's son Kenneth was one of 12 men travelling home from work when their minibus was ambushed at King's Mills in County Armagh by Republican paramilitaries. I was cooking the dinner in the kitchen and then some lady came in from a nearby house. She had heard more in the news, you see, than us. And she said, B, will you not get up and go up the road for your son's lying dead? That's the exact word she said to me. 
he was 24 and he had two wee girls. One of them was only three and the other one was six. And the wee one at three had his table set for him coming home from his work. And a fork and spoon, you know. And in the paper the next day and they were, there was, Daddy didn't come home. Mm -hmm. Colin Morton was only 15 when his brother Kenneth was killed. He was great. And I think you always want to end up like your older brother. You know, I was robbed of actually seeing, because I was still a child myself. The pain and sense of loss has never left them. It made me, you know, at 15 years of age, hate somebody maybe that I didn't know. You know, like, what did it achieve? Nothing. It only achieved that we have an empty seat and this is a seat in the way of us like cancer. No one has ever been convicted for the King's Mills massacre, but hunger striker Raymond McCreesh was later caught with a weapon linked to the attack. Colin believes putting the peace site at the maze would become a shrine to those involved in his brother's murder. We're totally opposed to anything, you know, to be left. H block, hospital wing, whatever else they have. Totally opposed to it. They should have flattened the whole lot of it. Well, I do feel that it will become a shrine, definitely. During the decades the prison was open, it was often seen as a microcosm of the troubles, marking moments of turmoil and the move towards peace. Its doors finally closed in 2000, and they have remained so ever since. For some Unionist critics of the planned peace building, the site will be a permanent insult to those bereaved in the troubles. It will be a place where people gather to exalt in uh, 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 and to glorify in uh, what the, those who are rightfully in that prison did uh, and to totally ignore why they were in prison and the crimes they committed and this uh, stream of victims they left behind them. I don't think any of us want to glorify anything. No Republican wants that to happen. All we want to happen on that site is that people are allowed to tell the history of the site. No glory, because when we look back, you know, in conflict, there, there is no glory. What we should do is reflect on the pain, the suffering, on the sacrifice, and allow people then to reflect on that. Jim Allister has organised a petition to try and overturn the plans to locate the peace centre at the maze and argues what's left of the prison buildings which are listed should be flattened. Well, if we need a peace and reconciliation centre, and that's maybe a debate on its own, but if we do, let me accept that we do for a moment, why would you ever build it on the most divisive site you can find in Northern Ireland by choosing to site it cheek by jowl? With the prison buildings, you are guaranteeing to tarnish the building, uh, to blight it and to taint it with the history of the site. So who decided on the current plan? Unionists blame each other, particularly over the listed status of the remaining prison buildings. The UUP go so far as suggesting a DUP Sinn Féin deal. It does appear uh, that the DUP's stance uh, on the maze changed in 2007 the very year that Ian Paisley sat down with Gerry Adams and did a deal. Now, we know that they sat down publicly together. Uh, they obviously must have sat down privately together, or at least emissaries on behalf of the two parties. What I would like to know is what they agreed behind the scenes with regard to the development of the maze. Well, that simply isn't true. Um, I have been involved with this issue right throughout, and I can assure you that at no stage did the DUP withdraw its opposition to the listed buildings. In 2007, the proposal from the UUP, Sinn Féin and SDLP was to put the Peace Centre into the retained buildings. We vetoed that. When uh, we took control in OFM, DFM, we said that isn't going to happen. And we held the line until the other parties changed their position. Deal or no deal, one commentator says for Republicans, the legacy of the hunger strikes is non-negotiable. This is something which had to be done to uh, give the rank and file of the Republican movement, and particularly and specifically, the rank and file of the IRA who fought the war. Uh, a, 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 they had to be uh, given a stake uh, in what has come out of uh, their struggle. 
Academic Chris Brown says all those with vested interests in the maze development are mindful of the sensitivities in their own heartlands. Here, as in common with other divided societies, history is live and contested and can often be used as a stick to beat your opponents with. It can be used as a valuable resource in peace processes, not simply to uh, wield over the other community, but also within your own community. For example, uh, mainstream Republicans would be very concerned about uh, dissident groups hijacking the memory of the hunger strikers, if you like. They would be fearful if they were to abandon the memory of Irish Republican armed struggle, that it won't simply be forgotten about, it'll be picked up by spoiler groups, dissident groups, who will use it for their own ends. Some of the details surrounding the project have been hard to get hold of, and for some, this has increased speculation of a secret deal. Over the last few months, unionists who are opposing the development of the maze say that they've asked for information on the site, including details on what kind of consultation took place and whether other locations were considered for the peace building. As yet, they say they haven't received any satisfactory answers. Over the last couple of weeks, we have also requested information on the site. We received no detailed response, but the Office of the First and Deputy First Minister told us they have consulted with the victim sector, and they said the process has been transparent, but that some of the detail is commercially confidential. I put in a request to go on site and see where the new peace building's going to be and have a look around what's left of the old prison buildings. But despite the fact that this is publicly owned land and funded by Europe, I still haven't got an answer to my request. So at the moment, this is as close as I can get to a building that's meant to be bringing us together. It is over there somewhere, there it is. For some, the reason we struggle to bring communities closer together is at the very heart of what's wrong with the peace agreement itself. There is still a huge job that needs to be done to assist Northern Ireland to come to terms with its past. Where is the debate about what forgiveness means, about what tolerance means, about how we can learn to live together with former enemies in peace? It is quite clearly an us and them government we have. It's quite clearly what we have at heart is an agreement to disagree. It's not conflict resolution, it's conflict stalemate. So every single thing they do has to be counterbalanced. I'm a bit worried about the colour scheme here. <laughs> <laughs> it looks so hard to me. <laughs> I mean, the, the unstated strategy uh, of some of those involved in these negotiations has been, let's let, fudge your way to freedom. Uh, you know, but it, 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 fudging doesn't settle anything. Fudging by its nature doesn't clarify anything. I think that what we have got here is a settlement which is based on permanent negotiation, permanent disagreement. It's never going to reach an end point. Inside this apparent fudge and agreement to disagree, all sides are competing to impose their version of history a process that, at its worst, just opens up old wounds again and again. Well, I think, in essence, there is a hierarchy of victims. I, I, I don't agree with it, but there is actually a hierarchy. You, once you make this moral you know, point that the terrorist, the man who pulled the trigger, is exactly the same as the man whose brain the bullet went through, you have debased all of politics, you've debased morality, you have undermined democracy. There is a hierarchy of victims in uh, Northern Ireland, that uh, there have been people who have died in the uh, war or conflict here that nobody particularly wants to remember. Sometimes, sort of, when we're debating, you know, the hunger strikers who died, or the Bloody Sunday uh, uh, people, uh, sort of, or the people who, who died in the Shankill bombing or in, in the Skillen, you have to wonder sometimes what the thoughts are of somebody who lost one person, he lost a brother uh, or a son. Are they supposed to just stand at their door and listen to all this and go in quietly and nurse their grief uh, on their own? Some people do, a lot of people do, but it's not fair, it's not fair. 
the Wharton family have always felt that their story has been largely forgotten. Nobody cares about us. We are, no. we are an embarrassment. Any yeah. innocent victim yes. out there that have suffered the way we have suffered, yes. Catholic and Protestant, is, is an embarrassment. They have got their minds made up what they're going to do and they'll stick to it no matter what we say or do. Oh, they don't care. Our pain's our pain and that's that. As long as they don't suffer it, they're all right. The fear for some is that the peace building at the maze will elevate some dead at the expense of others. If you were the proverbial visitor from planet Mars and you landed and you spent a week listening to radio, watching TV, reading the newspapers, you, you would be forgiven for concluding that only about 20 people died uh, during the Troubles. 13 of them on a particular day in Londonderry in the early 70s, and those were the victims of Bloody Sunday, uh, and a few others, high-profile cases. Uh, but 3,500 plus people died. Uh, tens of thousands have been affected with physical and mental health issues, and they are largely forgotten. But it would be wrong to think that all victims' families opposed the redevelopment at the maze. Alan McBride's wife was killed in 1993 in the Shankill Road bomb. You know, the victims and survivors are paramount in the society and their, 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 and their wishes and their feelings have to be taken on board, but they are not one person, they have mixed feelings. There are victims out there that undoubtedly would never go near the maze prison and would prefer to see it bulldozed to the ground. And there are others, as I've said, you know, that would gladly go there. And I think we do have to find an accommodation and room where all of these stories can be told as a way of actually finding a way forward. But are all stories going to be told? Because the First and Deputy First Ministers effectively have a veto of what goes into the project. Yet the man leading the development body says there is more autonomy than some think. When I first met with First and Deputy First, when they were appointing me, they talked about the independence um, of the Development Corporation. It's an arm's length body. Um, the Development Corporation own the land, um, so it is our responsibility to develop it, but against uh, those parameters that were, that were set down by First and Deputy First uh, and were enshrined at the beginning in the programme for government. Uh, doesn't sound very independent from government, right? Well, no, but you have to accept that uh, w when you're independent, it doesn't mean you're independent of life. You know, there is a responsibility that you have and there are always going to be people that you report to. For some, it's inevitable that the First and Deputy First Ministers decided to have control over this development. I think it's arguably the last people you should ask to uh, run this place uh, be nominees of OFM, DFM. On the other hand, in, uh, being realistic, uh, given sort of what's happening in Northern Ireland, I don't doubt that sort of that was the first and only idea that uh, the powers that be had. Let's have, let's have OMD, OFM, DFM run this place. Let's have Sinn Féin and the DUP share, out, share this out. After all, they're sharing everything else out. Why shouldn't they share out the maze long cash? For Alex Kane, having control over the project is key, both for Martin McGuinness and especially Peter Robinson. He knows that for a very core part of his audience, his target vote, they will see this as a shrine, and no matter what he says, they're going to see it as a shrine. It's almost like he's, he's sort of saying, look, trust me, trust me in this. I think the problem they now both face is that their key constituencies are, are disconnecting from them. They're saying, this isn't what we signed up to. So it's, it's remarkable in some senses they've managed to keep the whole process stumbling along. Chris Brown believes that providing a yes-no option or an on-off switch could threaten the success of the site. Everyone realises how difficult these histories can be to tell within uh, an exhibition setting. There is a, a series of protocols, practices, which museums put in place to try and deal with that. They don't generally include uh, giving uh, an on-off switch to a political leadership from a party, whether it's unionist or Republican. Jeffrey Donaldson was very clear about invoking that yes-no option in a radio interview. There will not be uh, 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 in the audio um, uh, about Bobby Sands, and, and there won't be someone there saying this is where Bobby Sands died. We are very clear. We will not countenance anything that would eulogise dead hunger strikers 
whoever they may be, no matter how notorious they are. And we've listened to what the victims have said, unlike others. That's why the Peace Centre, the new Peace Centre, will not be in the listed buildings. As Geoffrey Donaldson has said, that the name of Bobby Sands will not even be mentioned. That's so farcical uh, that no one should believe it. To be frank, it would be like telling the history of Manchester United without mentioning George Best. Uh, Sands and the Hunger Strikers will obviously feature as part of that project. The important thing is to ensure that other voices are in there. Alan McBride says we must respect each other's stories. And that's something that's not always apparent here. Whenever there's a debate around some contested issue, whether it be flags, whether it be the maze prison, uh, they're very back, very, very quickly go back into their own their own camps and mm. where they're coming from. And so, you know, I sometimes wonder: is it just is everything is it, is it just all at face value? And is there, is there any depth to, to, to the sort of the pursuit for peace? But it's not just families of victims who have opposing views. Former prisoners from both sides do too. Anthony McIntyre, former Republican prisoner and now a critic of Sinn Féin is fearful of what he sees as the legacy of the hunger strikers being erased from history. The unions are renovating the maze, but they're also fumigating it. And what they see as a need of fum fumigation is the Republican past, the Republican spirit that they see as haunting the, the, the corridors of that empty prison. He says it will be a betrayal if Sinn Féin allow Bobby Sands to be airbrushed out. I, I think it would merely confirm the deputy minister status of uh, Martin McGuinness because he would amount a little more on deputy dog. I, I mean, has things gone so bad that uh, Bobby Sands will be next th th described as some sort of mistaken criminal? Former loyalist prisoner Billy Hutchinson believes the prison will inevitably become a shrine. I think that, uh, you know, it would be madness to open that site as some sort of, uh, you know, museum or anything else because they're not going to stop it being a shrine. No matter what agreements you get, no matter what people sign up to, it's going to happen. I don't mean to sound twee or, um, you know, cliché about this, but the shrine that I want to see to the, the guys who died there is the new agreed Ireland that, that they died for, it. basically. It's, it's not some building. Um, outside Lisbon, you know, that's, that's, that, that, that's, not, that's not what they died for. Billy Hutchinson's also worried the role that loyalists played in the prison will be totally overshadowed. Not only has the history of Northern Ireland been rewritten by people, uh, and we've had this revisionism, and we're going to have it in the maze, and, you know, it's bad enough having to listen to people who tell me how they won the peace and how they done other things and, you know, revised all of this and left people out. Like many of his Republican counterparts, he feels any attempt to ban the mention of the hunger strikers will fail. How do you hold back um, answering questions to American tourists or anybody else who knows about Bobby Sands? If anybody goes to the maze, they'll want to know where Bobby Sands died. Why wouldn't they? So when any approved story about what happened at the maze is finally agreed for tourists to hear, will any of them actually want to go? To find out, I hit the tourist trail around Belfast. I think, I think it'll, yeah. be, it'll be an interesting, it'll be an interesting tour. Yeah, I definitely do. What would it, what would be the kind of thing you'd want to be seeing there and and, and and experiencing? Here again, trying to better understand what went on, why, and you know, you know where it might go from there. To be honest, I think most non-Irish people with real close Irish roots in the U.S. probably know nothing about that. I mean, if we were here at that time and it's open, sure. I wouldn't want to see it. I think it, again, brings back all the animosities. I think it'd be a very interesting thing. I definitely would go and see it and, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess insofar as we saw Kilman in jail when we were in Dublin, and that was pretty fascinating. And so to be able to see that in Belfast, um, I guess the conflict is a little bit later, closer to now, but it would still be very interesting to see. I typically don't go to places of torture or uh, incarceration. Uh, it makes me feel uncomfortable and I, I just don't put myself through it. So what, if anything, would people learn from visiting the maze? 
I went to see one man who knows the prison building very well and who wants stories like his told. Former Governor William McKee spent 27 years in the prison service. Personally speaking, I want to see the maze levelled. I mean, that's my first reaction. Oh no, level it. Let's bury all that. He had been in charge on the day that LVF leader Billy Wright was killed by Republicans inside the maze. The murder of Billy Wright would have been the lowest point because even then I couldn't anticipate what I was going to destroy in my life. Loyalist paramilitary suspected he had colluded in the killing. The death threats came thick and fast and the house moves followed. Um, and then, I mean, obviously the, the, the climax of all that was my medical retirement with post-traumatic stress disorder, when it got to a point where I just couldn't cope anymore. He says his time in the prison service cost him his marriage, his health and his career. But his initial objection to the maze development has recently changed. What society have been doing for so long now is they've been running away from it. And the maze thing may be the wherewithal that's going to make us actually confront it, confront our past, deal with it through this new centre, and then hopefully society can move forward. This year's agricultural show provided a shadow of the past hangs heavy over the main site, just as it does over Northern Ireland. The, the legacy of the conflict and the prisons were simply a part and parcel of that legacy. Um, until you have a process put in place to live all that, you're going to have controversy, you're going to have disagreement.